traps in Dungeons and Dragons. We all love them, but then in application, sometimes we hate them and they can be really frustrating to run or even figure out how to run or make them in the first place. But don't worry, I'm here to coach you up on how to build these things for yourself and on how to run them. I got a whole resource for you that we'll talk about in just a second. So in this week's video, we're going over how to run traps, the purpose of them, how to connect them to your world and to your players, giving clues and hints and secrets about how they are so it doesn't feel so bad if they just kill them out of nowhere. Should a trap even be able to kill a player? And a really cool homebrew rule from Alcanor's Almanac called the click rule that we'll get into. So what is the point of traps, huh? Point, get it? <laughs> my point i mean purpose what's the purpose of this trap so from the player's perspective the point's going to either be to kill capture or keep out and i'm also going to throw in an alert there though of things i've just thought of and this is more so the in-game reason why this trap is here is it to alert the enemies that the people are here now is it to actually kill the thing outright or just capture them and keep in the same spot and on the note of killing a player outright with the trap that's just something you really ultimately want to avoid you wouldn't necessarily tell that to your players straight up because like oh he won't kill me with a trap but a trap could definitely lead to a player's death if i tra if they encounter a trap and they kind of know they're in a trap room and there's some bad rolls that go bad somebody rolls low and then they already had low health from before and so now they go unconscious and then maybe some stuff can happen or maybe this is a more elaborate trap room where there's actually an encounter going on and it turns into a combat of some kind where they have to figure out this trap and there's multiple damage instances i have almost <laughs> killed a player under those circumstances but those are a different type of beast and that's really almost more so like a combat with a trap involved with it that feels a lot more fair if there's multiple rounds of things leading towards it and they have to try and dismantle it in some way and it might lead to a player death i'd be much more okay with that than one instance of one trap being triggered and it kills a player Ooh, that's a bit much but how much damage do you make this trap deal if you're not supposed to kill the player and you only want it to be a little bit of a setback or maybe you do want it to be deadly the dungeon masters guys has a damage severity by level chart and that's that's useful for sure especially for new dungeon masters but i myself have came up with a DC method for damage severity. Here's how it works. Now, first of all, this is just a recommendation for a dice value to start from. Anytime I have these thoughts, I think of this thought process I'm gonna share with you guys, and then I adjust from there, usually rounding down because I don't want to be too punishing with these traps and it kind of feels bad. Again, doesn't feel fair. We'll get into fairness here in a second whenever a trap just absolutely levels a party. But if they saw it coming and they went there for anyway, I don't feel quite as bad. But anyway, uh, the dice for this system are always going to equal your party's level. If your party's level five, you're going to be rolling five dice. If your party's level three, you're going to roll three dice. You get the idea. You have to decide as a dungeon master which of five levels of inconvenience you want to or damage severity you want to inflict on your party. The first level of severity is inconvenient. It's just a little d4. Then we move on up to setback, which is a d6. Then dangerous, deadly, and extremely deadly at a d12. So yeah, that's right. If a level five party were to encounter a deadly trap and fail the save they would be taking 5d12 damage yep that's a low end of 5 damage if you roll all ones and a high end of 60 damage and that's insane so another disclaimer before i lose you is very rarely if ever do i ever use the extremely deadly difficulty i just wanted to have five to match up with the five dice categories and i usually stay towards that d8 d10 range for the traps that i want to pack a punch and for the lighter ones you got the d6s and d4s but again this is just a recommendation that i have in my mind so if i have my level seven party and they encounter some trap and it goes off that 7d6 i am gonna make it 66 you as the dungeon master know what they've just went through before what are they about to go see how deadly do you want this thing to be what is its purpose as you move forward what's that you ask where can you get this super handy chart along with a ton of other homebrews in Alcander's Almanac of all things, this is one of the examples for damage severity. And there's also other methods for damage severity, along with hundreds of other homebrew rules for your entire game that is going to be releasing sometime soon in the next couple months. I'm still in the middle of finishing up writing this thing. It's really getting close now. But if you're too impatient to wait and you want even more resources on traps and other things to add to your games, think about joining my Patreon because during the month of February and March, I have a volume six trap resource this thing is a complete guide for traps in all its entirety i'm super proud of this thing you can build a trap and gives tips on like i'm talking about in this video on how to run traps and a step-by-step -step process you can go through along with a cheat sheet that lets you be able to build your own traps the way that you want for your specific games it has everything from triggers to set off the trap counters to dismantle the trap and a whole bunch of different effects so check it out right now over on my patreon or if you're watching this video in the future it's always going to be available on my website i just love traps so much so if you guys love traps 
like this video if this video gets a thousand likes in the next week i will make another follow-up video going over traps making some of these live i'll be using the system from start to finish and see if you guys like it and want to pick it up for yourself time out i almost forgot to talk about the point of traps from a dungeon master's perspective you can either delay them deplete their resources or combine it with combat that's the thing i love to do is the the, the complex trap example is have a combat but have some sort of trap element in there of a rotating moving thing that shoots off thing as uh, some sort of damage in the area around it or gas starts to slowly fill the room there's lots of different stuff you can put into combat with i love doing traps in combat but you can also have it just deplete their resources maybe those magic items that they're gonna you're gonna be targeting that they have or certain spells that they can cast maybe they have to cast a certain spell to get through you're lowering down their resources whether it's it's long rest things that would have to recharge maybe you're trying to bait them into a long rest because you have something you want to do with a long rest because whatever resources that you deplete is going to possibly delay them because they might want to get those resources back from resting and you see how it all ties in together okay just had to throw that in there. second big tip here for traps is connect them to your world and your players whenever you connect it to your world you want to think about who made this trap like wh who actual what type of creature what's the backstory of the people that made this trap where is this trap the environment the location what's the settings around it that could maybe even play into the trap and all of this further ties into its overall purpose is it some sort of temple that has sliding plates that move around with symbols on it that could be clues that we'll get to here in a second or maybe on a completely different note it's a super intelligent wizard that has traps laid out throughout his own lair or maybe it's a sneaky little kobold that has a bunch of really cleverly rigged traps with pulleys and levers. I don't know why this just popped in my head, but the most recent trap that I made was from an old woman that was protecting their house. And all it was was a sign that said, go this way. And her house was actually this way. And if you went this way, there was a uh, curdled milk that fell on your head. Yeah, no, not the most deadly trap, but that's the whole point. Who made this trap? Is it a evil warlock that wants to capture souls? So they are trying to that that just that alone makes me things start falling into place. I'm going to have it be a capture thing. I'm going to capture their soul in a jar. And speaking of PCs, souls, you want the essence of their characters to be represented in these traps, or at least on your mind when you're making them. What are your characters' abilities, features, what magic items do they have? What skill proficiencies or tool proficiencies do they have that they could potentially use to dismantle? any kind of trap. Your party's strengths gives you a lot of clues as to how they might try and solve this trap and dismantle it. And you can set them up for success by thinking about that too beforehand and putting those types of things as key parts of the trap. Is there a barbarian probably gonna use their strength? Put it something in the trap that can be broken. Is the ranger have a favorite type of creature? And the knowledge of that creature might lead them to knowing how those trap could work. Maybe one of your players has a cloak of invisibility and this trap's key component is that it has to see the creature to be able to trigger. And if they use this cloak, they'd be able to get right by. Another bonus tip on top of this is think about things that your players don't really use. What parts of their character sheet have they not touched at all? What languages maybe do they speak that could be very useful in this situation? Think of those untapped resources on that character sheet that have never came up, and it'd be super cool to have that thing be one of the solutions to this trap, if the player realizes it and thinks about it. And if they don't think about it, this is a perfect segue right here, leads us to number three, hints and clues to give your players whenever you're trying to run this trap for them, and they have no idea how to solve it, or they keep failing at different little parts here and there they can't put it together but to take a big step back here on this note you want to play fair you want the players to know that this trap is coming in as well and that's also what i mean by clues clues to if there's a trap there in the first place and clues of how to actually get through it so it's not just some unavoidable trap that just deals them damage and there's nothing they could have done about it because that feels bad to give your players a heads up that there's a trap i call these warning signs whenever they're walking up to this temple of some kind maybe there's a dead body on the floor with that's been impaled in some way and they look around there's no spikes oh, okay Ooh, but then that starts to lead them to look around the holes in the wall and they see that there are holes in the wall okay something's up maybe there's a weird smell in the air maybe they see some sort of glyphs or etchings or maybe there's a riddle of some kind to start to give them a heads up that something's going on here so they can start to be a little bit more careful so when they do end up messing up and a trap triggers they feel like they had some sort of 
uh, agency in this. Because if you are gonna take a player's soul and trap it in a jar, you better at least describe that there's some sort of wavy purple energy coming off of it, and it starts to get colder and colder as you approach it and almost touch it. Or if you want to be really nice, maybe a small insect flies over the jar, and as soon as it crosses over the top of it, it falls down and drops. Another nasty trick is to play this trap on the NPC first and have them trigger some sort of super deadly event that may or may not kill the NPC. That's always a great way to set the tone of a dungeon. But now let's go back to the clues. Whenever players see a trap and they're trying to dismantle it in some way and figure out this thing, you wanna be able to give them some sort of clues and hints along the way as they solve it. Not right off the top and start throwing clues at them before they're even able to start interacting with it. You wanna have a little stash of clues waiting and there's the, the most vague clues are at the top and the most juicy clues are at the bottom and you're just waiting there ready to give them one because the less clues you give out the more rewarding it's going to feel for them to figure out this thing this also applies to puzzles too but we could do a whole whole different video on that but have these clues ready in your back pocket wait for players to say things don't make them all based on checks because you don't want to put yourself into a check dead end hole here whenever they start rolling these checks that you're asking them for and they keep rolling low and then they just get stuck and now you have to like give them out clues for nothing which that just feels bad in general and then they succeed and then that still feels bad. So it things that they look for, it, it, from the temple analogy I gave, it, if they even say they look for the walls after seeing a body that has holes in it, if they even say it, give them a clue. Just give them that baby little surface clue about, oh yes, you do notice that there are sporadic holes on the wall. Do you wanna stick your eye up next to it and look down? Basically reward your player's curiosity about this thing around it and the world around it as they're trying to explore and investigate. And if they look for specific things where there would be things, you can just give them the clue. You can ask them for a check, but to clarify, all right, this is, I'm gonna give you something, but just go ahead and make a check for me and see if you can get even more. That's always a great thing as a dungeon master to, to put it out there. I'm gonna give you something. So so that then when you do give them something, it doesn't feel like, oh, they rolled a five and you still gave them something because you just pitied them. No, 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 you set it up beforehand. You set yourself up for success by saying, I'm gonna give you something. So now even if they roll bad, you're still gonna be okay. And then if they roll crazy, give them another clue. Another tip here is you can also have players make intelligence checks or history checks. I do lore checks all the time, which is I guess like a homebrew thing where I have them add their proficiency bonus plus their intelligence modifier if it's something that their character would no, because their character might not be proficient at history in general, but they would be proficient at what they've lived through. And if that player had asked any sort of questions about any sort of thing leading towards that, I'll give them advantage too. Because at the end of the day, you do want your players to get some sort of clues so they can keep moving through this thing. Unless you want it to be more challenging, then you can be a little bit more reserved with what these little <laughs> jar of clues that you're holding on to. Give them out less frequently if you want this to be more challenging. So when this player makes this lore check, whether you ask them to yourself, out of nowhere to kind of help the clue ball rolling or they asked for it themselves is give them some sort of information based on their lore. Maybe that ranger starts to remember something. You know, your research and your lore of dragons, you know that in general dragons tend to now the big fourth tip here on how to run traps is a really, really fun one. This one is in Alcanor's Almanac of all things, which again, one of the hundreds of rules in there of the exploration pillar of the game, because traps would fall under exploration. Quick disclaimer is I did not create the click rule. This is something I've seen. I don't even remember the first thing I've said. It was years ago whenever I first had heard of this way of running traps. But since then, I have taken it and ran with it, as I hope you do with anything that I say here on this channel or in this book or whatever resource that you find. But here's how it works. The click rule is something you got to tell your players beforehand is once they have entered a dungeon, you won't want to lead with it. Don't want to lead with it. Let them get a little sense of something's going on here. Like they see that dead body on the floor. They start to smell something in the air. They start to see see a trap trigger in front of them and it warms them. I tell my players that we are now activating the click rule and it is in place from this point forward until you leave and you get to a place of safety. If your players don't know what the click rule is and you never ran this before, explain it to them. How it works is if I say click in any sort of way, you can make a noise. If you can do that with your mouth, I don't know. As soon as you make a click noise, you point around the table. They have literally one to two seconds to say what their character does in this fraction of a second, and then you issue out what happens with the trap. Usually traps in Dungeons and Dragons are triggered by you asking for a dexterity saving throw, or you say that the smoke starts to come out, or you trip a trip wire and then make a dexterity saving throw, and then depending on the roll, and it's just kind of like this like, 
inevitable chain reaction of events based on the rolls. And if they roll bad, then something bad happens. If they roll good, then they dodged it. Ah, what if you want to get that tension at the table to where the players playing their characters are responsible for a little bit more if they succeed or fail? So here's an example to show you what I'm talking about. You have established that the click rule has been activated and they're on their edge of the seats. They're ready. They're walking through a hallway that you know a trap's on it. We'll keep it simple for this trap. It's just going to be a big old saw blade that comes horizontally coming at you right about chest level. Okay, so you know all of this and you ask them generally how they're traveling through this thing, ask them for their marching order, all the standard stuff. And then as soon as that front player gets to that trip wire, and you can have them make a dexterity saving throw if they would like, or have them make a perception check to see if they notice it. You can give, you can definitely implement checks here along the way. Let's say that front player's walking down that hallway, you ask them to make a perception check because <laughs> Passive perception, oh man, I could go on a whole rant about that. Let me know, leave me a comment if you want my rants on perce passive perception, because that's a whole thing when it comes to traps. But anyway, uh, they, they make a roll in the front and they roll low and they don't see it. And they, they walk forward and then you say, as you're walking down the hallway, you feel a little pressure on your ankle. Click, however you want to make the noise. You point around the table and see what they say. Don't ask them, what are you doing? The sound of that click is the, is the signal. They have literally no time at all. What are you doing? I'm gonna, and they have to say what they do. I'm gonna drop to the floor. I'm gonna jump up in the ground. I'm gonna go to the side of the wall, like whatever they, they try and do. Maybe the wizard panics and say they cast shield. I don't know, whatever they say, after that moment, you point around. If they say nothing, they automatically fail the save. That's what I do. You could be nice and just give them disadvantage or whatever, but if a player says absolutely nothing and they literally freeze, uh, they automatically fail the save. I think that's just funny. At my table, that's what's, it's, it's, a, it's a fun thing. It's not like I'm like, ha ha ha, I got you. It's not like that. And you know your tables well enough to know if it's just like, okay, maybe they get disadvantage or maybe you just wait for them to say something and give them some more time. But it's again, it's the, it's the tension and pacing uh, that you want to have at your table. So, so whatever they say after that really random smattering of people just yelling out what they do, now you go around and issue out what happens. So that saw blade coming at you down the hallway, the player that ducks automatically saves. Awesome, well done. The player that goes to the side of the wall, okay, I need you to make a dexterity save. So you went to the side of the wall, but it's still gonna come at you. You're gonna be a little less of a profile. Give me a dexterity save, and then we could keep going through the players. The player that jumped up in the air, you're done. <laughs> Give me a deck save at disadvantage if I wanted to be nice, or they just automatically fail based on the thing they described. And it's hilarious whenever players say that they do something that actually goes exactly against what they should have done in that situation. But again, let them have a disadvantage or something if you don't want to be too harsh on them. And then there's that player that said nothing. Okay, they fail. Now they make their rolls and you can see how it all plays out after that. Maybe that character that rolled at disadvantage went from jumping up. Maybe they rolled and they actually succeeded even with the disadvantage you could now describe that they jumped up over this blade coming at them and they actually cleared it which is super epic and it ties into what they said that their character did in this click of a moment so much fun if you use this please leave a comment on this video come talk to me in a live stream share these moments because i it, it is so hilarious and and the tension also uh, on the funny side of things and on the serious like high tension side of things what are you doing it's very empowering for players to feel like they their thoughts and their reaction to things can give them advantage in the game so if you like these creative ideas and you want advantages in your game think about joining my patreon it really does help what i do here I have an entire resource this month for traps and every single month that's coming out after this, I'd make monthly DC playbooks, which are D&D resources to help improve your games, magic items, bonus perks for your characters to help customize your game, homebrew rules to customize your game, monsters, tons of stuff. I just want to help you guys with making your lives easier. And one of the big things that I needed to learn in dungeon mastering, and it took me a while to do and create this system to now give to you guys to help you guys learn how to build traps and how to run them and have the most fun possible at your game table. So until next time, stay creative, think outside the box. Peace.